Hello, I'm Morgan Pechman, Executive Director of New York Civic, and this is Candidate College. A well thought out media strategy is critical to the success of any campaign, but first time candidates often find it difficult to get the attention of the press. Well, in this episode of Candidate College, moderator Alexis Grinnell, one of the city's top political communications consultants, talks with some of her fellow experts and members of the media about what gets their attention and how you can keep it to run a successful media strategy. I hope you enjoy. It's going to be, I think, a lot of fun, and I want us to encourage conversation and discourse uh, because it's a rare opportunity that we get so many talented people in one place. So I hope you enjoy. And with that said, because I'm a nerd, <laughs> I thought I'd start us off with something uh, really nerdy. So the media is often referred to as the fourth estate. And that's because the 18th century philosopher and statesman Edmund Burke once famously said, in referring to British Parliament, there were, were three estates in Parliament, but in the reporter's galley yonder, there sat a fourth estate more important far than they all. And that segues nicely into why we're here. So when you're running a campaign, running the media on it, or if you're covering it, the narrative is hugely important. The narrative and how you frame your candidate and what your campaign is about um, is the message, right? And that's what, what the media will cover, except they also have you know, their own minds and hearts and are able to see exactly what's going on. So it's a little bit of a dance. And that's why what we're going to be exploring today, two major themes, the issue of earned media versus reactive media. Earned media is what you come up with and put out there. So a press release, a press conference, it's how you further your message. It's a story you want to see written. Reactive media is everything else. That's what comes at you. That's the attacks your opponent lobs at you. That's the investigative, good investigative journalism that a reporter brings to your feet and says, hey, so I noticed that your candidate voted when he was dead. What's that about? That has happened to me. So um, those are two things I want you to look at for broadly as we move forward. And I'm going to do some brief introductions. We're going to dive right in. To my left is Jimmy Bielkind. Jimmy, despite his youth, is a veteran reporter working for the Times Union. You may read his incessant and insightful blogging at Capital Confidential. He is a former reporter at the New York Observer and Daily News. Reed Pillifant, sweater clad as always, former editor for the New York Observer, now at Capital New York, writing dynamic profiles and deep analyses, which are, I would say, mostly right. <laughs> Shockingly. And Damn, Steve 50, Cohen, 50. 50, 50. Steve Cohen, late of uh, the Governor Andrew Cuomo's office, serving as his right hand man, Secretary of the Governor, Chief of Staff in the Office of the Attorney General, brilliant strategist, and also primarily responsible for the marriage equality campaign. So, yeah. Uh, Crystal Ball, we are lucky to have with us, is a contributor to MSNBC, political pundit, and former candidate for Congress running in 2010 in Virginia. She's now a New Yorker, and we're thrilled to have her. Matt Wing, late of public advocate Bill de Blasio's office, director of communications. Matt saw Bill through a contested three-way primary, a murderous runoff, and was with him in the city con council previously. So, that was intense. And Andy Hawk, and yeah, I'm... Here. Andy Hawkins, last but not least, Deputy Managing Editor of City Hall News, which if you're all doing what you should be doing, you will be receiving daily 6.30 a.m. rundowns of everything you need to know, ever. Uh, Andy has covered numerous campaigns and still manages not to be bristled in any way whatsoever, fresh-faced as the day he was born. <laughs> so this is a little broader, but I'm going to start with Jimmy, actually. Can you give me one or two of the most effective media strategies in your years covering politics that you've observed in a campaign? What you thought, be they characteristics, specific tactics that have worked best with you, for instance? And pass this along. Most effective media strategies. I, I think that Alexis just touched briefly in her introduction about, as a candidate, it's your job through the media to tell the narrative of your campaign, to tell the story of your campaign. Uh, to have an arc, to have a story, 
And I think that when we look at candidates, for example, David Webber, who just lost a race for Congress, candidates who do poorly are candidates who cannot concisely and compellingly talk about why they are running and why they deserve to be elected for their office. You know, it's, I, I think of it in the same way um, in, in a different kind of separate hobby life. I do college admissions interviews. You know, we've all gone through them. So we have kids who've gone through them. And I always want to say, you know, what, I, I want the kid to tell me why college X and why that is right for you. And so that's really what I think is the core of a good media message. Um, and now thinking back on some of the, the places where this has been done very, very, very effectively, uh, there are two races that I covered in 2010 where I thought the candidates understood this, they understood how to take an arc, construct a larger arc, and, and, and move through it. Uh, one is Andrew Cuomo, our current governor, who was then Attorney General. And he put a lot of thought into his media strategy. I'll leave it to, to Steve to talk about just how much thought goes into, goes into that and what, what the exact inside track is. But the way he launched with a video, he building anticipation, laying out policies, talking about what he was going to do, talking about why he was running. And throughout the whole campaign, there being a very clear message and a very clear case. Uh, and the other one was in actually initially not 2010, but a man who I covered in the Albany area, a congressman named Scott Murphy, who was defeated in the 2010 elections. He's a Democrat, he's a venture capitalist, and he ran in a special election to replace now Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. And he beat a seasoned incumbent legislator named Jim Tedisco, who's a Republican member in the State Assembly. And he had one issue, one message, and I can summarize it thusly, I'm going to work with Barack Obama and Kirsten Gillibrand to create jobs in upstate New York. You could have asked him what his hair product was, and he would have gotten those three words into his answer. And so as a reporter, it's sometimes frustrating for me. But I think in terms of a media strategy, your question was media strategies, um, finding a message and sticking to it, not deviating from it, not engaging, not, not straying, so to speak. Uh, and I think... Andrew Cuomo did that as well in terms of bringing competence back to government. I'm going to give this to Reed. Actually, um, since we're talking about Andrew, I thought we might give Steve a chance to talk about what that message was. Yeah, the specifics of the, the Cuomo campaign um, really are no different than, than real, you know, what I would argue is any campaign, but I would even say it's a broader context here when you talk about developing a narrative. Um, I am a trial lawyer by training. And the thing I learned early on is what your summation is governs the entire approach to how you investigate and ultimately try a case. It's, it is that last statement that you're going to make to a jury. Campaign is no different. It is what is it that explains the rationale for why I'm standing before individual voters and asking them to support me. And if you can't answer that question, you might as well not run. And people who have floundered on that question, probably most famously, um, for those of you who are a little older, Ted Kennedy, when he was mounting a potential challenge to Jimmy Carter, had a famous interview when he is asked, why are you running for president? Couldn't answer it. And so if you really think about it, that crystallizes what it's all about. Now, for Governor Cuomo, and without getting into the details of how do you actually come up with the process, how do you weigh it, what issues now, what it boiled down to for him and for those who were working for him is you had had years, you could even argue a generation, of a lack of competence in government. That expressed itself by people saying, well, there's dysfunction. It expressed it by people saying, there's corruption. Government doesn't work for me. The special interests have taken over. Whatever it is, the answer was, we need to return competence to government, and I work for you. I worked for you as the Attorney General, I will work for you as Governor, and it's about competence. Now, once you know that's what you're saying, and this is really the, the art form and the discipline, you back up from it, and you say, okay, from the word go, how do I frame every issue to try to fit that? So if the day-to-day the, the, the -day 
how do we do this, is really the only difference that exists between strategy and tactics. Right? Strategy is overall, what is my message, where am I going, what am I saying? Tactically, how do I drive that home? So I have a reporter calling our communications director saying, yeah, so much for competence, you guys in the AG's office screwed this up. So I guess you're not that competent. Do you care to comment? Mm. See, that's what I've now got to react to. So the important thing is always to remember day to day, and you know, curiously enough, Matthew Wing is here who dealt with some of this with us in the AG's office. The question was, and what I was always focused on, is how do you bring that kind of question back to the overall message? And that is what you're about day to day. And what you, what you want to do is not get embroiled in that daily mess that is life and forget overall what is my message. It's all got to go back to that message in a credible way. And I think that's what, you know, if you really want to talk about w one of the things that Governor Cuomo is great at, I think there were, you know, many reporters will say almost to an annoying degree when it's, it's running well, it becomes very difficult to get the governor and his staff off of that overall message. I actually, uh want to jump in here. I, I am at MSNBC now, but I have much more experience uh, from the candidate's perspective. So I'm sort of speaking from with that in mind. And I ran in a very tough district in Virginia um, for me as a Democrat and uh, mounted a challenger uphill battle against an incumbent. And one distinction that I wanted to make is there's a little bit of a difference between how you're going to approach things if you're an incumbent or if you're the favorite versus if you're a challenger. You know, one of the things that you also have to think about is who is my opponent? You know, my opponent, we, our goal was to portray him as the establishment. You know, he's the problem, he is Washington. And I am in opposition to that, I am change, I am fresh, I am energy. So that's another piece of this that you have to think about. It's not just who are you and what are your strengths or your candidate strengths. It's also who is your opponent and what kind of a box, what kind of a frame do I want to put around my opponent. So that's one thing I wanted, wanted to add there. The other thing is, um, you know, I ran for Congress um, and it's a relatively big race, but still the amount of attention that the media and the voters pay to it is very, very, very small. Okay, we're not running for president, we're not running for governor, most of us. So you have to keep things really simple. And this goes back to what Steve was saying. Everything you say, everything you put out, everything has to drive your essential message and that needs to be boiled down to like two words because voters have a lot on their plate. They're just not paying that close of attention. So you have to boil it down very, very, very simple. And everything you say, everything you do, anytime you're writing a blog post, anytime you're in the local paper, answering questions, whatever you're doing, it has to drive that message. So Crystal touched on something that I want to have Matt Wing address, actually. She mentioned that Congress is more high, high profile, but even running for Congress, you're only going to sliver of things covered. So this takes us to kind of what's news? And that's what earned media is about, making news. And this is something Matt knows a lot about. Um, the public advocate has long been criticized as being like, you know, what is a pointless office. And somehow, uh, <laughs> largely due to some strategic communications on Matt Wing's part, the public advocate is very successful here in New York City. So Matt, can you talk a little bit about how to make news? And then we're going to ask a lot of reporters about what news actually is. Thank you. Um, I think to start by touching off of what um, Jimmy summed up really well uh, is uh, when you're forming your message, he said it has to be compelling and concise. And I would really, I mean, I think there's two types, and as Crystal was just mentioning, there's sort of two sort of worlds where campaigns can exist. There's the world where you're running for governor, you're running for president, you're a leading candidate, and a lot of people care, and a lot of people know who you are. And then there's everyone else. And for those people, Making your message compelling is, is and, and not just compelling for normal people, but compelling for reporters, knowing their mindset and what they care about and what they're interested in is, is key because you can have you know, a very beautiful, simple message. I believe in creating jobs. Um, if you're running for city council, I mean, who cares that you believe in creating jobs? That, that's great, but no reporter's going to write that. So um, 
we certainly struggled in the public advocates race in 09 to to gain attention and, and quite frankly it was it was a race where I think we did perfectly well in the media, but where the media aspect was certainly not nearly as important as things like field and endorsements. Um, but the message we had was was Bill as as a as a, as a coalition builder, um, and and as someone who was sort of a grassroots organizer who could really bring together people on the ground. And that was a, and the reason that message was crafted that way was it was sort of twofold. It was both to you know hopefully normal people still feeling excited about Obama, but you know for the word grassroots, for something about coalition, for people who are upset about term limits. There's a lot of talk about the coalition against term limits. But then for the insiders who were, you know, the people who were making endorsement decisions, the people who were going to be giving money, the people who were probably the only people actually reading the blog posts and insider items that we were getting in the paper, it was saying, we're going to have a lot of field. And we're going to have a lot of people knocking on doors, and we're going to win because we have that. Not because we have high name recognition like our opponent did not Green. Um, and making it compelling was, was I, I, I actually still think we could have done better. It was really, it was really hard. We, you have to, you for political reporters like uh, Mr. Hawkins over here, you have to sort of think that they care about the the meat and potatoes of the field operation. You know, when you get a union endorsement, how many doors does that mean you're going to knock? How many how many members are they going to be able to commit to on the ground? How how much resource and what difference does it make in the campaign? Um, and then when you think of other sort of broader media like the New York Post, the New York Times, the Daily News, frankly the only thing they, they really cared about um, was when you were saying nasty things about your opponents. Um, which is why it's this lovely irony of um, a lot of the electric poll up poll says they're sick of negative messaging. Well, I, you know, when you can't get the papers to write anything else, I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's what we're going to put out. Yes. <laughs> that's all if, I can, if I can dive in. That's an interesting point. I, I think that if you talk to, to people about politics, if you talk to people who are not in the political world about politics, they're focused almost exclusively on ideology, focused on positions, rhetoric, and ideology. And I think that a lot of journalists um, focus on that very little, in fact, and kind of almost belittle the ideology because, or not the ideology, but your rhetoric and your promises and your talking points because they're just that. They're talking points. Of course you stand for jobs. Jobs is a great noun. That's a wonderful noun. Reform is another great noun, but it's just a noun. And I think what Matt just touched on in terms of what matters in a campaign, what is it important for people to understand about in a campaign is more complex than just the message. You talked about field, you talked about union endorsements and what that's going to mean. That's something that is news to me. That's something that is important to me. And that's something that I'm going to put forward as I express your candidacy to the larger audience to talk about how he is taking money up the wazoo from hedge fund managers, as I can see from these filings. He has the support of every labor group and its mother, as shown by these endorsements, these field operations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the point I'm trying to make is you should be cognizant of that. You should be cognizant that for political reporters that that is news and that it will be written about and that it will shape the narrative about you that develops in the news media. Because that's where you're going to convince me that you're credible. That's where you're going to convince me that you are someone who has a shot at winning, who has the, uh, who thinks on a political wavelength sufficient enough where you could possibly be elected. Um, but at the same point, my mother doesn't care about that. My mother doesn't care that 1199 is gonna knock on doors for you. And those are the things that get buried on page A52 of a paper and they don't necessarily express your candidacy or explain it. So you have to be cognizant of what stories are going to run where, which is why uh, places like City Hall at Andy and, and our blog are, are different than, say, traditional mainstream media outlets like the Times Union, which is the, the printed edition of the paper that I work for, or the Daily News, the Post, the Times, the Wall Street Journal, weekly papers in the city, et cetera. I'm going to have to sort of stretch over here with Matt, apologies. But yeah, uh, Jimmy's absolutely right. You have to know about the, the publication that you're pitching the story to, uh, the type of news stories that they uh, normally would write uh, in, in sort of contrast to other publications. Publications like my own, City Hall, is very, uh, it's a very niche publication. It's an insider uh, newspaper for people that are exclusively involved in politics. And, uh, 
a, a paper like my own is going to be interested really in like the nuts and bolts of a campaign. Oh, thank you very much. And the nuts and bolts of a campaign, the, the uh, not, maybe not the, the broader narrative of X candidate versus Y candidate, here are the things that they're discussing, but uh, the, 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 the kind of story that is about you know, the, the demographics of the, of the district and the type of voters that you're attempting to turn out, maybe certain constituent groups that you're attempting to reach. Uh, facts, things that are uh, uh, sort of uh, true, sort of unequivocally true that you can't get around, and if it's if it's a if it's something that's about your opponent, if if one campaign is trying to pitch a story that is about the the opposite campaign, it, it, it can't just be a mindless hit piece that's you know this person you know doesn't brush their teeth every day or something like that. It's got to be something that could be that could be proven and that's fair. That is uh, you know something like you know maybe you should look at this candidate's uh, this candidate's history, this candidate's business record, if they're a business person sort of, you know, what happened to their business while they were running it. Uh, I've heard some interesting things about that. And sort of the reporter can then take that that sort of tidbit of information and run with it on their own and find the, 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 the clips and the, the evidence and the people that will talk on the record to corroborate the story. It, it becomes a much more interesting story than, you know, you should just write about how they're in the pocket of business. A big business. Well, that's that's nice to say on the stump, but it has to. If you're going to write a story about it, I, you know, we, we can't just write that story without looking like we're in your pocket. So it has to be something that uh, can be built on top of that and uh, sort of uh, be looked at more broadly uh, than just uh, you know what you would, what what the, the one candidate will say about another candidate in the course of a, of a campaign or a debate or whatever it is. And just just to jump in about trying to sort of set up your opponent in some ways. Uh, it's important to be sort of careful about that. Uh, one of my old colleagues, and actually one of one of Andy's old colleagues, in a congressional race on Staten Island, uh, was provided a spreadsheet labeled Jewish money. Um, <laughs> that was uh, about all of the Jewish money that his opponent had taken from Jewish donors in Manhattan. And uh, that, that got a whole lot of notice. And uh, the guy ended up losing in a really close race. I mean, it's hard to know if it's because of that, but those kinds of things can really throw off the narrative that you're trying to create. Because for days, it was stories about who provided it, whether the candidate authorized it, whether he was going to fire the person who provided it. And those things can just drag and drag through the news cycle. And at that point, you're not talking about jobs and, and the kind of nouns that, uh, that Jimmy suggested you should be talking about. So um, you have to be a little bit, a little bit careful about uh, those kinds of things. Steve, yeah. Which mic do I take? I'll take them both. <laughs> One of the things that, that ends up happening, it's already happening here, and that I lived with for four and a half years is there really are two different worlds that are, that are in play here. One is the obsessive compulsive reality in which you live every day as a candidate or as an elected or as a reporter. And then there is the overall perception of what's going on in the world with the normal folk out there. And what ends up happening to a lot of people is you really do get lost in this avalanche of information in blogs and you end up fighting a fight that no one is even paying attention to and then suddenly people are writing stories saying why has this campaign run off the rails? That's the reality. Now, trying to pull all this together, it's sort of it's an interesting exercise because I'll take it back to what I said. You really want to, as a candidate, say to yourself what we started with, what is the narrative? Who am I? Why am I running? Now, if Crystal is running, and she's running against entrenched, established, elected officials, she really epitomizes that. The spine of what she's doing really becomes that campaign slogan. I think it was Jimmy who said something interesting, talking about nouns, reform, a noun, you got to stay away from the noun. Yeah, well, so the campaign slogan then becomes, when she's running against Jimmy, reform <laughs> is a verb, right? And that's <laughs> what you... You just lost. You right, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> you've already now, you've, on the one hand, I'm cute and I'm snarky, and, but I don't come across as being nasty, but I've now, for Crystal, defined an election why she's different. Now, everything I'm going to do in that campaign is going to go back to this spine, right? <laughs> And anything that is dragging me away from it, even if it means, and I'll be blunt because this is a, a astute 
crowd that understands the way the real world works. If that means I've got to, at least in theory, get to a place where I am bludgeoning an opponent, I'm not going to do it with my candidate, or I'm going to do it in such a way that no one even knows we're doing it. Right? If I am defining my candidate as a corrupt representative of the status quo, I am going to get as much information to prove that point and find a reporter who's hungry to write something and make sure that they have the resources available to them to get that story done. And by the way, I don't even want to be part of that story because Crystal over here, she's not interested in that. She is sending a broader message, reform is a verb, we're about the new order, we're going to change things. That's, that, that is the tension, but that is the hard part. Now, how do you get attention when you're running in a very local race where it's not the Times Union, it's not the New York Times, it's not the New York Post, it's not even City Hall covering you? That is a trick. But remember, those people in that neighborhood have their own way of communicating. It may be the local blog, it may be through the schools. It's the same world, only it's smaller. And what you want to figure out is, how do people convey information and how do I begin to influence that? But it's the same game and it's the discipline that says, I'm going to stick to what my game plan is until I realize it doesn't work. But if that game plan works, and by the way, it should work or you wasted a lot of time at the beginning, why you lose is not because you, you get off point, it's because you get mired in things or if the message just doesn't work. But generally speaking, if you can control the, the issue, if you can define the issue, you win. I mean, the person who was brilliant at this was Ronald Reagan. Right? Ronald Reagan today, we are discussing things, whether you like them or you don't like them, the man was a genius. He simplified everything. I remember he walked out of a meeting, and I don't even remember what the meeting was about, involving taxpayer issues, and I think it's probably the same debate we're having today. And his line was, how did it go, Mr. President? Taxpayers won. Special interest zero, we're doing great. Right. It's that simple. Crystal, take uh, I just, oh. I'm running your campaign now, by the way. Great, I, I could use your help next time around. Thank you for that. Um, I actually wanted to, to relate something that happened to me um, during my campaign that is very much in line with what Steve was saying, and you can use this information uh, as you will. But, you know, one thing uh, early on in my campaign is we have uh, in my local town in Virginia a few really, really nasty sort of over the line local blogs that no one really pays attention to. So they would write all kinds of horrible things about me, but they have like, you know, 100 readers. So we weren't that concerned about it. But what happened is they kept writing the same story, something something about my financial disclosures, and there were questions about X and Y and Z, which was completely not based on any facts, wasn't based on any reality, it was completely conjecture, and they pulled my statements and they wondered about X, Y, and Z, and they were writing these sort of stories insinuating that there was something wrong there. Well, because these few nasty local blogs were writing these things, the local paper actually ended up picking up the story. And this is a, a new world, right? This was not news. This was not something that a local reporter would have on their own written about because it wasn't based in fact. It was all insinuations. But because these blogs were writing about it, suddenly it was news. So this is something, again, that happened to me in my race and that you have to be careful about. So on the one hand, you know, you're not going to want to respond to every petty, silly attack in the local blogs that nobody reads. On the other hand, you have to watch because it's possible that if they keep it up, it could end up being a real story that you actually have to deal with. Um, I guess the flip side of that is if you are more of a Machiavellian uh, type of candidate campaign, you can use that to your advantage, and that's one way to get the attacks out on your opponent that you may not want to come directly from your candidate. So if you have friends in the local blogger community, and you know, I'm assuming all of you want to run ethical campaigns, and there's merit to your story, um, you know, that's one way to get the ball rolling on something that maybe you've been trying to get into the mainstream local press and they're not biting on it if some of the local blogs write about it possibly maybe they will